So um, I'm hoping you can hear me. Am I on microphone? Yes, fantastic, great. So thank you ever so much for coming to tonight's event. It's very cold outside, so I really appreciate you coming along to tonight's event. Uh, it's a pretty big day today for um, Brexit. As we've seen, Nigel has made an announcement today that he's going to stand down candidates uh, in the south of England. Unfortunately for Ed, that means that uh, you were a Brexit party PPC for the area, but now you're just a passionate passionate um, uh, person of uh, the Constitution who wants to uh, explain more about that in a minute. Um, but firstly, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about what Leavers of Britain is. Um, and it is a social networking group for people who are enthusiasts of leaving the EU. It was started in November last year, and we have over 10,000 members across the country currently. And I know a few of you in the audience are from some of the groups around the country. We have Cambridge and Norwich here today. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. And it's needed because people who voted for Brexit feel as if we are sort of excluded from the mainstream, that our views aren't quite acceptable to the mainstream when we have a perfectly legitimate political voice and reason for voting to leave the European Union. And that must be made again and again and again. And with the European Union trying to make this into a long-winded situation, it's important that we club together and make sure that no matter what and no matter how long this takes, there is a group of people that will always have the voice of the 17.4 million people that voted for Brexit. So the reason for the discussion today is that, as we've seen for the past three years, we've been trying to get out of the European Union. And we've been thwarted by people such as John Burko. I never know how to say his name. It's John Burko. Yeah, John Burko, um, who has broken many of the rules in the, rules book, in the rule book of Parliament and indeed made sure that he's bent them into the favour of the Remainers. And also we've seen the judiciary, who, in my personal opinion, have acted politically. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. And without further ado, let me introduce you to some very distinguished guests, Mr. D Dr. David Starkey, who will be giving a bit more information and a bit of history to the Constitution. But he's a fantastic historian on the Constitution, but also an author and massive TV personality when it comes to giving us a little bit of history to do with our country. But also Ed here, who's an amazing supporter and sound opinioned person on the Constitution and on Brexit. So thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for agreeing to talk today. So Ed, without further ado, over to you. What's going on, what's happening and where do we go from here? Okay, I thought I would say a few words about the origins of this event. <laughs> which began in June of this year. It began in June of this year because I made my first foray into internet journalism um, and published a short piece. I published a short piece in the. Um, that's that, one. that better. Right. I published a short piece in a website that calls itself The Conservative Woman, which I should immediately stress has nothing whatsoever to do with the Conservative Party and indeed uh, frequently spits its contempt of the same. Uh, but they took my piece, which I wrote under the title of From Rotten Boroughs to the Rotten Parliament, and I was inspired by the forthcoming bicentenary of the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, which of course was the era of the rotten boroughs, and I thought that it was highly significant that in 2019, 200 years later, um, we'd done away with the rotten boroughs in 1832, um, but we had arrived at what I call the rotten parliament in 2019. And one of the things about internet journalism is that uh, you generally have a blog section where people can put in their comments, uh, most of which were favorable. Um, but one of them was very instructive because he quoted from um, A.V. Dicey, Albert Venn Dicey, um, and I confess I hadn't heard of Dicey until that point. So when that happens, I generally go to Amazon and I buy a copy of the book in question. <laughs> 
And that was really quite an interesting read. And then there was a letter um, that I wrote to the Sunday Telegraph in response to a, a piece by Professor Robert Toombs, who is the um, uh, originator of the Briefings for Brexit website, which I had found really very uh, instructive. And I thought to myself, reading Toombs' piece, he hasn't really put his finger on the mark. And so I penned a letter to the Sunday Telegraph and I quoted Dicey. And Dicey was the jurist in the 19th century who developed the distinction between the uh, legal sovereign, that is the queen in parliament, the queen, lords and commons acting uh, in unanimity, and the political sovereign, which is basically you and me, the electorate. And even in the Victorian uh, period, it was quite clear that people understood that it was the job, ultimately, the, of Parliament to represent the will of the nation. And that's exactly what we haven't had at the present time. And I um, found out later when I approached uh, David Starkey that he'd actually seen this letter and uh, had found it illuminating. So he may say a little bit more about that. Now, I'd like to um, just begin this by explaining maybe what is something of an enigma in the advertising flyer that we produced uh, and why we chose a particular title. And first of all, it begins with Magna Carta because we're in the town that claims Magna Carta as its own. Berry says that it is the cradle of the law. Um, and I looked through the clauses of Magna Carta, which you can still find in force in English law today, including the famous Clause 40. And where on the um, scan and the image of the Salisbury Cathedral uh, edition of the Magna Carta, you have a small yellow box, that really is the location of Clause 40. I scanned through the whole lot myself to find it, and it's blown up uh, down at the bottom using uh, some of the ligatures which are conventional at the time for common Latin endings but may make it confusing to read. So the, uh, the Latin is down there below. It has the distinction of being the shortest uh, clause in Magna Carta, just nine words in the original Latin. And the English translation, which you see above it, we will sell to no man, we will not deny or defer to any man either justice or right, is uh, what you will find if you Google Magna Carta 1297, you can actually find it on the National Archives under legislation.gov.uk, and it really does come up looking like that. The 1297, by the way, is simply because that is the date at which it became a statute of King Edward I and was entered onto the role of chancery and became a written part of uh, English law. And although that is normally understood in the context of legal proceedings, it did seem to me that it served as a metaphor, at the very least, for what has happened uh, in Parliament over the last three years, with not just the 17.4 million people who did vote to leave the European Union, but really the whole nation that subscribes to the democratic principle. And above that, I put for you the... Um, little clip, the significant part of what was said at the time of the referendum, this is your decision, the government will implement what you decide. And that was the government leaflet that went to every household in the land. Finally, we've got something of a rogues gallery of notable personalities uh, that have um, played significant parts, let us say, in the um, uh, situation that we arrive at today. And I hope that uh, really explains, if there is anything enigmatic about it, uh, why we chose uh, the title that we did. And um, with that, I think it's time for me to hand over to David. Right, am I audible? Good. So I can sit down. That's a great relief. Um, can we get the nonsense of Magna Carta out of our heads? Bury St. Edmunds has nothing to do with it at all. It's, uh, I fear, wonderful though the place is, it's one of those nice fictions. Um, and of course, Magna Carta, as Ed said, isn't 1297. That is merely when it uh, 
uh, in a very late stage gets into parliamentary statute. Magna Carta is 1215 and the 10 years after that, as I try to explain uh, in my book on the subject. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because we have a constitution which goes back directly to Magna Carta. It is the oldest functioning constitution in the world. Now that has, ladies and gentlemen, advantages and disadvantages. And I think it's time that we faced both of them. What Magna Carta does, the famous Clause 40, which has just been cited there, is part of it, and that's certainly the part that most applies in what we would call the rule of law. On the other hand, the key, as the key aspect, the really crucial aspect of Magna Carta is that essentially it stops the king imposing direct taxation without some form of consent. And if you look at the various iterations of Magna Carta, which go through from 1216 to 1217 to the 1220s and so on, you see there's a very interesting shift. The original Magna Carta of 1215 is a deeply revolutionary document. If it had lasted, we would be an aristocratic republic like Poland or Hungary, and Magna Carta would have dissolved a few hundred years later in some form of peasant revolt or disintegration. We had the enormous good fortune that we had, and I'm going to use a word that will be spat at, the equivalent of a David Cameron. We had uh, William, Ma William the Marshal, Earl of Pembroke, who was a brilliant conciliator and he took over, uh, John of course fortunately dies very soon after Magna Carta, he's succeeded by his little son, uh, the infant Henry III, and the key version of Magna Carta is one of these absolutely characteristic British things. Here is a revolutionary document that is forced upon the monarchy by a brutal aristocratic cabal. What does William the Marshal do? He reissues it in the name of the young king and leaves all the difficult clauses out. It is absolutely characteristic of England, and moreover, we do it in a completely authentic this minister fashion. There is a note in Magna Carta which says, the following points are too difficult, so we've organized a committee to consult on them, which never ever reports. Uh, and so that's what turns Magna Carta from a revolutionary document into a proto-constitution. And then finally in the 1520s, the man and uh, uh, your mother was actually at a school that's named after the family at, at, at Langton Grammar School uh, in Canterbury, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Simon Langton, um, who had been uh, the principal negotiator uh, at Runnymede. He comes back into great favor with Henry III as an adult, and he gets the charter reissued in the name of the adult king with the actual seals of the adult king, but with two astonishing modifications. The first is, it is issued to everybody, not just the aristocratic elite. And secondly, it's done in return for a grant of taxation. It's a bargain between the king and his people. And that provides very directly the basis of our parliamentary constitution. And what is very striking from that point onwards is that you mentioned Edward I and the parliamentary enactment of Magna Carta. Parliament is already functioning by the end of that century. But what again we forget is, it is the strong kings who make parliament, not the weak kings. The reason that parliament has misbehaved so badly over the last three years is that it has forgotten this lesson, encouraged by people with no knowledge at all, like Speaker Burko. Um, uh, and why, does, why do the strong kings encourage parliament? Because the English discover, quite astonishingly, that it's easier to raise taxation if you ask people nicely first and explain why you're raising it. 
And so Edward I and then Edward III, the great imperial kings, Edward conquering in Britain, uh, Edward III uh, conquering uh, in France, they're the ones who extend the power of parliament, and it's extended most of all by the most brutal, aggressive, and self-regarding of our monarchs, the man that I've spent my entire life studying, of course, with no adverse effects on my own character, namely Henry VIII. And Henry VIII uses Parliament to carry through the first Brexit. Can we understand that the Reformation is genuinely the first Brexit? Because the Roman Catholic Church is primarily a body of law. That's what it is. It's a body of law. That's why, that's why Henry has got to go to Rome to get himself divorced, because the abbey there and the church generally control much more of everyday life through a legal set of arrangements than the king's law. They cover probate. They cover contracts. They cover family law. They cover the control of public opinion. They control education. And all of that is forcibly repatriated through Parliament under Henry. And the great legislation of the Reformation Parliament is absolutely specific in saying this land of England is an empire sufficient to itself and that no foreign potentate power or body has any right to exercise power within it. And that is the authentic position. And moreover, ladies and gentlemen, what is very striking is that they rather surreptitiously repealed that in the 1960s as part of a general sort of carpet bagging of the Law Commission, and I think we can guess why. Moreover, what happened in the period of the Reformation uh, that extraordinary Reformation Parliament has got two very direct consequences for where we are now. It invents the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. That is to say that Parliament has got the right to do anything. And this is based on a fundamental legal definition that everybody in England, it's the English Parliament, is represented in Parliament either in person or by his representative. That's what gives Parliament its absolute unique quality. And it's moreover something that distinguishes the English Parliament from almost all other representative assemblies. We think there's something special about the English Parliament, as it were, because it goes back a long way. This is not true. Every other major and most minor European countries also have parliaments, but they disappear. The peculiar thing about England is that the parliament survives. And the reason for that is that it's useful. The parliaments that disappear are the ones that get in the way of good government. And if you look at the last two and a half years, you can see why you might want to get rid of Parliament. <laughs> if you look at Spain now, which is on to its fourth general election in less than two years, and is still entirely incapable of forming a government, you will see why Parliaments get abolished. If you look, even in the super state, super solid, super secure democracy of Germany, Germany is beginning to come apart. The only way it has been governed is by what they call a grand coalition, which is the equivalent of Jeremy Corbyn and, and Boris Johnson getting into bed together. The thought is too appalling for words, but you get the idea. Literally, it has been a coalition of the, the equivalent of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, which, of course, has destroyed any form of sensible ideology, has led to extremes on both sides in terms of the, 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 the Greens, the far left, and the rise of the far right. How did we avoid this fate? Well, the answer is, of course, we didn't. In the 17th century, we must never forget we are the first major European state, in fact, I think we are the first state full stop publicly to try and execute a king. There is a huge clash 
between the powers of this parliament and the power of the monarchy. And everybody will tell you, of course, that parliament won the civil war. They are wrong. It didn't. The army won the civil war and imposed a brutal military dictatorship that makes the government of Henry VIII look like a cakewalk, which is why there is a reaction from it and 1660 and all the rest of it. If we just leap forward a little bit, why is a new settlement able to emerge in the period at the very end of the 17th century? It emerges for one very simple reason, religion. The king gets markedly out of line with the Protestant sentiment of the country, with James II actively trying to restore Catholicism. He's driven from the throne, and instead, well, we do exactly what we... Oh, we've lost something, haven't we? Uh, we've lost sound completely. Let's see if this... That comes back. This is attached to yours, Michael. Hang on. Uh, this has come back and works perfectly well. Uh, we know better than to trust microphones. Um, uh, it's the uh, remarkable uh, actions of the Glorious Revolution in which, for the first time, a people actually remove a monarch, bring in another monarch, as indeed very nearly happened with Magna Carta uh, when you invite the Prince of France in uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, overthrow King John. Uh, but back in 1215, they foolishly forgot to get, King, uh, to get uh, King Louis, as he would have been, to agree to Magna Carta. They didn't make that mistake in 1688-89. William had to agree to the Bill of Rights and to something even more extraordinary, that the king had to have the religion of his people, not his people, have the religion of the king. You invert. And this leads to a completely new sort of, it's a, it's a republican monarchy. This is what we really have with all the pomp and circumstance. We have a republican monarchy and the man who makes it work is the man who, the an anniversary of the beginning of his premiership and the very beginning of the premiership will be celebrated uh, uh, next year in 2020. Uh, that is, of course, uh, the great Sir Robert Walpole, a very familiar figure in East Anglia, who learned how to put together a parliamentary majority with royal authority, doing it, I hate to say, by corruption and using the, the position of, of, of royal offices and whatever to buy a majority in Parliament. Because what you have to have, this is what we've got to understand, a Parliament cannot run a country. Five or six hundred people cannot run a country, as we've seen completely in the last two and a half years. An elected assembly cannot run a country. The only way a country can be run, and I can cite everybody from Robert Walpole to Disraeli, is by parties. That's the way it's got to be run. So, ladies and gentlemen, and now I, in, the, in the ears of many people here, I imagine I'm going to commit heresy, we may not like the Tories. Yes, his boo. We may not like Labour, I'm sure, a much more authentic his boo, but we do need two broad basic parties. That is why we have had hundreds of years of fundamental political peace in this country. A multi-party system cannot run parliaments. And it is a catastrophe that we're getting ourselves into this position. If you have multi-party systems running parliaments, as you do in much of continental Europe, no decisions are taken by elections. They're taken by backroom deals between politicians after elections. If we believe in some direct contact between the government and the people, we have to acknowledge it is imperfect. All human arrangements are imperfect. It is the best there is and the only one that's ever worked. If we want, let me just address now where we are. If we want, for example, to have a highly active judiciary, fulfilling the, and this again is the catastrophe of the Blair government, but fulfilling this quasi-constitutional court role. If we want 
as Burko left us with this legacy of a, an activist commons. Every time you hear somebody say it's important that backbench MPs are heard, don't believe them. Backbench MPs should shut up and have a job elsewhere. It is a catastrophe paying them. Backbench MPs have nothing to do. They're superannuated social workers. Um, um, and they're getting in the way of real social workers. Um, I mean, this is, you know, can, can we just face facts? Um, that you could make it the way we could, if we, but if we wanted something like the US Congress, in other words, if we wanted a House of Commons that was activist, that had important standing committees, that was a proper career for somebody of ambition, that we pay them seriously, what you have to do is to have a directly elected prime minister because you would have to have a government as the American constitution which has an independent authority. Otherwise, you will be in exactly the position that we've been in for the last two and a half years. If you have a government that doesn't have a majority, it is at the mercy of every fleeting moment in the House. So how did we avoid this fate? Because unfortunately, I think in many ways, the Robert Walpole system of gentle corruption, uh, I mean, it produced the civilization of this room, for heaven's sake. It created the beauties and the prosperity that you see round us here in Bury St. Edmunds. It creates the glories of Houghton and Hocum and the magnificent flourishing agriculture and Wedgwood and God knows what. Its achievements compared with ours are pretty substantial. But assuming we're going to go down the roads of democracy, assuming we're going to do all of that, how is it to be made to work? Well, here again, it's the astonishing adaptation of that aristocratic constitution of bribery in the 19th century into a constitution of party and open and genuine elections, which I think is the great achievement of the British Constitution, and it's above all due to Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, the first proper leader of the Conservative Party, and what he does when he takes this enormous gamble in 1867 to give the votes to the ancestors of myself and Edmund, who were horny-handed sons of toil, uh, his in South Wales, mine in Oldham, um, and he takes that decision uh, because, oddly enough, as the Times obituary said, like the sculptor looking at a block of marble, he sees the conservative in the British working man. And he was, of course, right. And what he does in 1867, you introduce a very broad-based ballot. Uh, it's not by no means complete. It excludes the unskilled worker. But everybody who paid rates, everybody who had a house that was even at rental and who was male, was entitled to vote. And you see from that point onwards the steady broadening of the franchise until it's complete, with even women being allowed to vote uh, after the... Uh, uh, after, after the, well, some women, uh, uh, after, after the First World War. But how do you adapt that parliamentary constitution to democracy? This is the key thing. It's done through parties. What you see developing, particularly in the 1880s, are two things. You see the developing of a very, very, between the first Reform Act of 1832 and the 1860s, parliament, parties break down. Parliamentary parties, the old Whig and Tory parties, break down. They are restored following the general ballot of 1867. And you, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating development. And what you see is all candidates stand on the basis of a parliamentary manifesto and they stand as representatives of a party. They are not elected as individuals. And when they're in their house, they are whipped. They vote according to instruction. Now, you can already see this system fully fledged. How many people here have heard Iolanthe? Gilbert and Sullivan's Iolanthe. Come on. Has, has, this, has this passed out of the culture? It's tragic. Um, there, 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 there are some wonderful productions of it. But if I say, and every boy and every girl that's born into this world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative, and a lot of dull MPs in close proximity, or thinking for themselves is what no man can stand with equanimity. This is the, this is the great soliloquy of, of Private Willis uh, in, in Iolanthe. Already satirized this system 
of a whipped house. And then the second thing that happens, and this is where Burko comes in, um, uh, you create a system of parliamentary precedent and authority which gives absolute precedence to government bills. And particularly over, well, the, the, the money bill, it goes right back to the 18th century, but it's extended to virtually all other bills. The, of course, the cat catastrophic general election of 2017 with that appalling woman, Theresa May, um, nobody has been less qualified as a prime minister. I mean, it's inconceivable how she got the position, but there we are. Um, but her loss of majority destroys the first principle which is a majority in the House, and the behaviour of Burko as, uh, as um, what's he called, a speaker, destroys Erskine May. And this is why Parliament has disintegrated in the way that it has, and why it's been able to obstruct in the way that it has. Uh, and why, of course, ridiculous notions pervade by people like Dominic Grieve that MPs are individuals who are ambassadors to the assembly of the nation, uh, instructing us all through the purity of their hearts and the superiority of their knowledge in what we should actually you know, do and pay attention to. That's how it's happened. So that's a brief account as to how we've got where we are now. And some of it, I'm sure, is painful, isn't it? Because we have to recognize fundamentally, unless we're going to have absolute total constitutional revolution, we have to try to get back to two solid parties. It's not ideal, but ladies and gentlemen, even we English are not ideal. We're just human. Thank you. <laughs>something that I, I thought was really interesting in sort of the story that's been going on for the past few weeks is um, how uh, Remainers have react to the judicial process when, it was, uh, when Parliament was prorogued. Um, do you think the judiciary has overreached, Doctor? I was preposterous. I mean, prorogate, right, there are several things. I've just mentioned the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights of 1689 has Clause 9 which uh, says that proceedings in Parliament shall not be questioned before any other court or tribunal. It is a determined attempt to distinguish between the sphere of law and the sphere of politics. Because if you look in the 17th century as part of this terrible struggle, remember our 17th century is abominable. It's violent, it's brutal, it's destructive in the most appalling way. And by the way, anybody who believes that Scottish independence might be a good thing, go and look at the 17th century, when only the crowns were united, but there were two separate parliaments. It was, relations between England and Scotland were worse in the 17th century than even in the Middle Ages, and were more violent. Um, you know, history can reverse itself. It doesn't have to go forward. Um, so you've, you've got then the... Um, uh, and I'm now going to reveal that, 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 that um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I've gone back too far. Um, the, but the, the Clause 9 is determined to produce this separation between the process of, of, of judicature and the processes of, of, of Parliament. What is astonishing in the decision of the Supreme Court is that it took an extremely narrow view of what Parliament is. Edmund, in his introduction gave the correct definition of parliament, which is the queen in parliament. It is the monarchy, which effectively means the government exercising the royal power, the lords and the commons. Instead, the Supreme Court, led by that very appropriately named man, Lord Panic, uh, decided that it was simply the proceedings in the commons. And on the basis of that came up with this notion that a prorogation was independent of proceedings in Parliament. This is nonsensical. Prorogations like the openings of Parliament and the closings of Parliament are a fundamental part of the proceedings in Parliament and prorogation has always been used as part of parliamentary management. You see, the problem is the Supreme Court, again, 
you were at the opening of The Critic. Right. But the first article that I wrote for this new magazine, The Critic, is on the catastrophic doctrine of separation of powers. This piece of all bad ideas come from France. It is overwhelmingly the case. <laughs> this is Montesquieu. And the idea of the separation of powers, yes, the judiciary needs to be largely separate. But do you think we would have had the crisis in our court system if there'd still been a powerful Lord Chancellor in the cabinet? I don't. Can you, can you imagine Mackay of Flashfern allowing this to happen? I can't. So what then happens is that Parliament tradition, the, we have got this peculiar system where traditionally there is no separation of powers. The government sits in the legislative and the government controls the legislative. If you look at the American model, where the executive and the, executive and the legislative are separate, they never do anything. The American Parliament, sorry, the American House of Representatives and the American Congress does hardly anything. It is merely obstructive and a nuisance and an unbelievably expensive one, and, and which means that all important decisions, like abortion, have got to be taken by the Supreme Court by falsifying an eight. Can you imagine deducing the right to abortion from an 18th century constitution? Or indeed, deducing the right to racial equality from an 18th century constitution is demented. Um, it's deliberate perversion of language. Um, uh, so what the Supreme Court did was to misunderstand parliamentary sovereignty, was to misunderstand proceedings in Parliament, and to assume that Parliament's only duty is to oppose, to hold the government to account. Whereas the beauty of the English system and why it's worked and why we've been able to govern ourselves as well as we have governed is because Parliament is managed and prorogation is a fundamental part of parliamentary management. I mean, I can give you so many examples. I can give you the example of Elizabeth I, the only way that she actually gets um, the, uh, the first, uh, well, uh, the, 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 that, she, that she gets uh, the act that reintroduces the Reformation, the religious settlement of 1559 through, is by a tactful prorogation. Because of course, when parliament is sitting, even in the 16th century, you couldn't clap up even aggressive Catholic bishops the House of Laws in jail. They're protected by parliamentary privilege. So what they do is they prorogue parliament conveniently over Easter. They convene a, a rigged debate uh, about the church. Two Catholic bishops walk into the trap and say outrageous things about the queen. And you just clap two of them in jail. You lean on the abbot of Westminster to abstain and that gets the legislation through. And, and again, to look at the other side of the story, the Labour government of the 1940s um, gets through fundamental reform of our constitution, that's the Parliament Act of 1910-11, uh, which was intended to only block legislation if it is submitted to the House of Lords by the Commons in two successive sessions. How do they sort that out? the opposite of what dear old Boris wanted to do. You've got one session of six days and one session of five days. <laughs> when, of course, it was assumed that a session would last a year. So that's how you do it. And, and the judges, I mean, I cannot understand their mentality. I do not understand their ignorance of history. I do not understand their arrogance. And I do not understand their self-regarding spiderish vanity. <laughs> <laughs> So, David, I'd like to take um, up with you uh, one point that uh, you, you touched on there. You said that uh, the crown effectively means the government. You have also said in previous interviews that you considered that the um, settlement of 1689 uh, by the Bill of Rights was basically completely now broken, shattered, and, uh, uh, and gone. Now, one of the things that I wanted to ask about here was the position of the monarchy and the so-called personal prerogatives of the Crown. Because one of the things that struck me about the Supreme Court judgment as soon as I heard it come out was, my goodness, the Supreme Court has abolished the monarchy and nobody has noticed. Because uh, the, these are Her Majesty's judges. They allegedly hold office under uh, the Crown. 
And yet, they are saying that the queen herself cannot exercise the personal prerogative of prorogation. And I think that was surely behind the decision of all of the lower courts, which said that we can't actually touch this. Um, and it comes up in another context, potentially. I mean, it didn't arise. But there have been two occasions in the past year when it has been seriously discussed in, in the press that the government might actually have to recommend to the Queen that she refuse the royal assent to a bill and thereby prevent it from becoming law. But if one follows through the um, precedent that the Supreme Court has now set, um, you can imagine a situation where if that were to happen, the Supreme Court would say, no, 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 the um, Queen piece, is, ab is, 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 is obliged to give the royal assent under all circumstances whatsoever. And so one ends up with a situation in which the monarchy itself has no reserve powers at all. Now, some people actually do think that that might not be a bad thing at all. I've come round to the view that it's probably a bad thing because if there are no reserve powers that are exclusively reserved to the person of the monarch, then what on earth is the point of having a monarchy? And yet, that seems to be part and parcel of the 1689 settlement that you say is broken. I mean, would you agree that the loss of the personal prerogatives that seems to me to be implied by the Supreme Court judgment is part of the breakdown of the 1689 settlement? Uh, well, I've already said something controversial about uh, Remembrance Sunday, so I'm not sure whether I can really allow to say anything controversial about the monarchy. I mean, I think it's very important we're quite clear on this. The real question at issue is who invokes the prerogatives of the monarch? The convention has been absolute since the reign of Queen Anne that it can only be done by a responsible minister. That's been the absolute convention. And that if it's done by a, um, a responsible minister, the courts cannot and will not question it. What happened in the ruling of the Supreme Court seemed to me that that rule was broken. That, in other words, nobody expects the Queen personally to exercise her prerogatives. Precisely what happens with Robert Walpole and why this whole tension is solved is the royal prerogative remains, but it is only exercisable when there is a responsible minister. And what was shocking about the Supreme Court was if Parliament had objected it could and should have simply voted no confidence in the Prime Minister. That is the proper machinery by which, uh, as it were, um, a, 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 a ministerial instruction to the monarch is to be challenged, not by judicial process. So that's one side of the story. But you see, I think there's another one, and this is where I really am going to commit heresy. Uh, if you, and it is, I'm afraid, I think that much of the present situation lies directly at the door of the Queen. And I know we're not supposed to say anything nasty about her and that she's been a very good thing and that she's a wonderful old lady and all the rest of it, all of which is true. But she came to the throne saying very clearly that she wished to rule as her father and as her grandfather. Her grandfather in particular does exactly what King whatever he's called, the Spain, I lose track. Um, uh, whatever the King of Belgium is called, whatever the Queen, the King is now King isn't it, of the Netherlands, what the Queen of Denmark, whom I know quite well and had a wonderful exchange with her. She's famously good with her hands and does things like decoupage and designing ballet. Mm -hmm. And on one occasion I said, what was her favorite hobby? So when she replied carpentry, I blinked. How, how, your Majesty, do you use a black and decker? No, 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 no. <laughs> she smokes like a chimney. She said, making and breaking cabinets. Um, she is the political, she calls it carpentry. She is, the, she is the political referee. And George V was the political referee. It's George V who puts together the national government at, you know, in the aftermath of the general strike and the, the catastrophe of the Wall Street crash and whatever. Uh, he is the one who stage manages uh, the metamorphosis of Ramsay MacDonald into the leader of a national government and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and the Queen 
began playing this role, of course, uh, famously uh, in the succession to Macmillan, uh, where she was induced to choose uh, Douglas Hume rather than Butler, and then she took fright. And the result is we have no political referee because the speaker has refused to be impartial. The, the, imagine if you'd actually had, as we had with George V, what, how different the last two and a half years might have been. If you had a monarch with a long-serving, highly intelligent private secretary with multiple contacts right over the political spectrum, can you imagine how utterly different it could have been. And again, this is something we are going to have to look at. If, and I, you know, I pray it doesn't happen, but if we go down the route of a multi-party system, you're going to have to have somebody who can manage the debate about the formation of coalitions. It can't be the speaker. Right throughout, throughout all monarchical Europe, and remember most of Europe is a monarchy, we forget this the whole of the time, or you need a highly, Italy, Italy has only survived its repeated political crises because you normally have a seriously heavyweight incumbent as a president who can exercise this arbitrational role. And if the monarchy doesn't do it, then I'm afraid I wonder what the devil the point of it is, apart from, you know, I love this. I'm a historian. I love it. I love the fact that, you know, I can analyze a royal wedding using much the same language that I would have done if I'd been watching the fifth marriage of Henry VIII, you know. Uh, but, but, but that is sentiment. Sorry, I knew I, I said I was going to commit heresy. So, um, David. And I, can be, I should be challenged on that, but I'm in, and I'm very willing to be, but I'm, you know, we're an intelligent audience, and I'm not just flattering you. Um, uh, and, and I think, again, one of the things that's gone so wrong in public debate is that people have dared, people will not dare to say what they think. And, and I am passionately, passionately opposed to that. We've got to debate as intelligent individuals, not screaming and not shouting, uh, but, but countering point with point. And that's what I've tried to do. But it's obviously open to somebody else to counter me. One question I have on my mind is that if um, the judiciary has acted politically, does this might mean we're becoming more Americanized? We're, yeah. we're going to more Americanized but system? See, this is the, the, look, the, the whole way in which things are going. If you have an activist commons mm -hmm. that is managed by a speaker, that's just like Pelosi. Yep. in America. Um, and again, if you're constantly saying, oh, we want to pay MPs more, if you're saying we want to have highly active committees mm -hmm. that will scrutinize finance, foreign policy, social policy, that's exactly the root of the House of Representatives. Um, and, but the only way you can make that work is if you then give the executive an independent democratic mandate. Otherwise, you have Spain, you have Belgium, uh, you have Italy, you have us for the last two and a half years. And see, again, it's because people, because this is just not explained. You get a lot of burbling in the press. Um, um, if that's the case, um, how do you make sure it's partisan? Uh, do we need a written constitution? Do we need to start putting pen to paper? But we can't have a written constitution because there would be no agreement. Because we're, 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 you know, we are in genuinely a uh, 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 catch-22 politically. We are a divided nation, which then me a divided nation whose, whose constitution is disintegrating because of the division. But there can be no agreement as to how we get out of it. And I've noticed the very extraordinary silence that has fallen on the judiciary. I get the strong impression that there have been murmurings in the ends of court about which you may know, uh, may, uh, may know more than I do. Uh, because after all, uh, remember, the three most senior judges in England, the Lord Chief Justice, the Master of the Rolls, and the President of the Queen's Bench Division, um, all ruled without equivocation in favour of Boris over the prorogation. So the real judges, as opposed to the highly academic judges of the Supreme Court, knew what the law was. The, 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 so it's not so much that the law is an ass, the law is split, despite the apparent majority in the Supreme Court. 
um, there, there is clearly, uh, there are two views. There is a, a new view of the role of law and a new view of the role of the Supreme Court. And then there is the traditional view of, of what I would say is the proper Bill of Rights view of the division between politics and the bench. And we've been going on too long. I think we should get our yes. audience involved. Shall we? Yes. So I'm going.